there's some more openness to suggestions. While in a trance, the patient might be able to understand their disease or why they do what they do a little bit better. Welcome to the Learn Skin Podcast with me, Dr. Raja. And me, Dr. Hadar, where we discuss all things skin. Join us as we delve into the art and science of skin health in today's episode. Hey, Raja, can you say the thing I told you to tell them? Of course. We are board-certified dermatologists. This podcast is meant for educational and informational purposes only and is not considered medical advice, nor does it serve as a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. All opinions shared do not express the views of Learn Health, Inc. Let's get to the good stuff. Hey, Raja, how are you today? Hey, Hadar, another podcast. What are we talking about? Well, I don't know, but if you kind of calm down your voice for a second and help me center myself and really put me in a hypnotic state, I may recall what we're talking about, but it really slipped my mind. Maybe somebody hypnotized me. Are you catching my drift? Every pun in the book's getting thrown out here with the kitchen sink. But guess what? We're not listening to either of us. We're talking to another expert who's going to be talking to us about how she can incorporate this into her medical practice. We have Dr. Samantha Sharp, who is board certified in family medicine. She is on the faculty at the University of Wisconsin and has also been board certified in integrative medicine. And she's been doing hypnosis with their patients since 2010. I can't think of another better expert. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Hi, Sam. Yeah, so we're talking hypnosis today. My gosh, you know, I think most people, when they think about hypnosis, they think about magicians standing on stage or the circus. Is that really what happens in a medical practice? Can you give us some of the basics about hypnosis in medicine? Absolutely. The first thing I tell people when people come to see me for hypnosis is that all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. And so whoever is having hypnosis done to them is in complete control the whole time. So the people that you see up on the stage doing all kinds of crazy things in Las Vegas, those are people who have a tendency to enjoy being disinhibited anyway. And so it's not like they would have complete amnesia of the event once they got off the stage and their brother would be like, oh, my God, did you see yourself? That's not how it works. People remember everything. So you tell me I really wanted to take off my clothes on that stage, huh? That's right. Okay. Damn. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, hypnosis in general is the way I describe it is that it's kind of like if you have a ray of sunlight and then you have a magnifying glass to help focus that beam of light. It's a state of relaxed and focused concentration. And when people are in this state, and I'll talk about that state a little bit more in just a moment, people are more relaxed, they're more open to suggestion, but they're always in control. The work of hypnosis is done in a trance. So if hypnosis is a river, trance is the water. That's where like things actually happen. And trance is not fragile. You can walk in a trance. You can drive in a trance. If you've ever driven from one place to another and you arrive and you don't recall anything about the drive and yet you made it home safely or wherever, you were in a trance. You were doing something else. So that feeling of flow that you might get if you're lost in a book or if you're cooking or gardening or exercising or drumming or praying or chanting, that's a trance. And it's a really powerful state to be in. Yeah, that's, I think, something we can all relate to, right? It's very easy. And and thank you for saying that because people talk about trans and I think that there's a feeling among people that you have to be sort of floating above the earth (laughs) at least six inches to be in a trance. And I think so. I think thank you for helping to clarify this because I think that's very useful. How does one get into that state and what is the role of the physician in helping them? Right. So, you know, I think one thing that I, I also want to emphasize is that when there, there is some misinformation that people will say, if you can go into a trance, you obviously are weak minded. You don't have a very strong will or you must not be very intelligent. And the truth is, the smarter you are, the better you are at hypnosis. And so that's for some reason, that is one of the reasons why we don't recommend doing hypnosis for certain people. And we can talk about that more later. But it's, for instance, little kids who can't really do abstract thought aren't great candidates for hypnosis. But when I see someone for hypnosis at that first visit, we talk a lot about the reason why they're coming in to see me. I do a lot of education around hypnosis. I answer any questions that they have. I screen 
for trauma, if there's a trauma history, I only use hypnosis for things that I know how to treat medically. And I don't have training in trauma. And if someone has a history of trauma, especially if they have memories that are potentially repressed, hypnosis might not be a great option for them because it is very relaxing. And sometimes memories that you've worked hard to kind of keep away come to the fore. And so what is the opportunity, biologically speaking there, that we leverage in medicine? What does a state of trance or hypnosis is useful for? What is the state of mind in the susceptible individual, if you will, that we leverage in medicine in general? I guess I feel like there's some more openness to suggestions while in a trance. There also might be more of an insight. The patient might be able to understand their disease or why they do what they do a little bit better because their guard's down a little bit. Oh my gosh, I can see huge benefits to that, removing a lot of those barriers, because I think a lot of health is starting with bad habits. And so I can see an easy kind of low-hanging fruit there for utilization in medicine, but I guess we'll get to that. So tell us, so you started saying about not treating something you can't treat medically with that, right? Correct. So, I mean, I, I don't do trauma work. I don't integrate multiple personalities things like that. I do treat a lot of habit disorders. It can be, man, lots of things. It can be smoking. I do a lot of smoking cessation hypnosis, but also things around hoarding or habits like eating at night or picking is one that I'll see people for. Interesting. Yeah. Helping to motivate people for lifestyle change. The gut is incredibly suggestible. So there's a lot of work with IBS that's been really satisfying. And there's a lot of good research around hypnosis and the gut. Insomnia is a really nice one. Preparing people for surgery. This is a huge one. People, people get so nervous before surgery, especially if they've never had a surgery before. And so hypnosis allows them, since I know what a surgery is like in general, even though I might not know the like nuts and bolts of what happens in the surgery, right. I can kind of prepare them and walk them through. So it can help with any of that pre-op anxiety that people have. One of my mentors for hypnosis used hypnosis as an alternative to her anesthesia when she had her knee replacement. So it can be incredibly powerful. Now she is a physician as well. And she kind of handpicked her anesthesiologist so that she and the anesthesiologist could talk and have an understanding. I don't think it would really work all that well if like the day you went to surgery, you met your anesthesiologist and like proposed that you didn't get anesthesia and just went into a But (laughs) Yeah, no, that doesn't sound like a good idea. (laughs) But she did it. So she did her whole knee replacement without anesthesia or any blocks or anything. Wow. Yeah. There's also some pretty good data on using hypnosis for vasomotor symptoms of menopause. Now, this can be great for women for whom hormones are contraindicated. Also for cancer survivors, this is a way, I mean, what I, what I really love about hypnosis is it gives patients some agency. It allows them to do something for themselves. We're doing so much to our patients that this is a way that they can kind of take back a little bit of the ownership of some of their health issues, which is really important. Yeah. And it sounds like a great opportunity. I want to talk about so much here, but before we get to that, if you don't mind, can you tell us in a couple of sentences what actually happens in the room? So a patient comes in and then what? So then we start talking. I find out what they want to work on. I get information about what they enjoy and what they don't enjoy. So if I have patients who love gardening and that's something that they know puts them into a trance, we start in the garden. You know, when we start doing the hypnotic work and they are relaxed, they're usually in a room and it's quiet. We'll start with them visualizing their garden, but I'll also find out if there's things that I definitely shouldn't mention. And that can be anything from phobias to I almost drowned as a child to I had a terrible childhood and I don't even want to remember what it's like to be a child because sometimes I'll have people remember things. If I have that information, then I can avoid that and help make it, you know, as positive of an experience as possible. And I guess what I'm getting at is the patient goes and lays down on a couch or do they just sit in a chair, close their eyes, you count back to 10, (laughs) there's a trigger word. What, What really happens? 
So they sit down. The first visit I have people sit down and I'll explain why in just a minute. And after I've gotten all the history that I need, I'll usually start by having them take themselves to a place that they love and a place that is relaxing for them. And I'll have them use all their senses, knowing that most of us have one or two senses that are really strong. Not everyone can like use all five senses all the time, especially when thinking back to a place. And then I do count down from 10. It works. I have done other things like having people walk downstairs or walk down a path. Basically, there's there's somewhere to go. And it's maybe it's 10 down to one and maybe it's walking down a stairway. But you're going to end up somewhere, kind of a stopping point, where by the time you get to the number one or the bottom of the staircase, you're feeling deeply relaxed, really at ease and are able to ignore all of your surroundings, all the ambient sounds that are around you because you're so engrossed in what I'm talking about. At the first visit, I will do something called trance ratification. And what that means is I have them do something to prove to them that they are in a trance. Most of the time, I will have them hold out their arms and imagine that they're holding a bucket in one hand and some balloons tied to their wrists. And I will fill up that bucket with dirt and rocks and water and bricks and cement. I mean, I don't know. I I will put anything in that bucket as that bucket gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And they can feel the weight of that and their arm will sink. While at the same time, the balloons are tugging at the wrist and pulling it up and up and up. And I'll have patients open their eyes and look at their hands And they kind of laugh to themselves. And so we kind of laugh. And then I say, just set down the bucket and let the balloons float away. You can also do things like... That's amazing. It is amazing. And what's really amazing is part of your brain's like, this is the heaviest bucket I've ever held. And then there's another part of your brain that's like, you're not holding the bucket, but it works. And so I do that. You can do other things like making your hand like a a glove of numbness. And so it can touch anywhere that you would like to be numb. Or people can have olfactory hallucinations where they, you can tell them that they're smelling something and they'll be like, yeah, those lemons, I smell them. They smell wonderful. So that is just for them. That's not for me. That's for them. And then we move on. And that's only at the first visit. Then we move on to the therapeutic work of hypnosis where we are getting to whatever it is that we're focused on. You know, I think you mentioned the example of skin picking, which I think is fascinating. So maybe we can use that as an example. And before you go into that, I mean, I think to our listeners, it's not so far-fetched to believe that people will do this. I mean, we all suspend our disbelief as a group. We go to the theater and we kind of sign this mental agreement in which we all believe that we are on this kind of journey with the actors in front of us. We do this in the movie theater. We suspend our disbelief all the time. This sounds to me like something that you suspend your disbelief for a little bit for yourself and then you find this kind of trance kind of state. So I can totally get on board with that. So let's take that example of skin picking. How do we deconstruct that and use hypnosis to assist the patient? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that you can take a real concrete approach in terms of like, let's talk about stopping the mechanics of the picking. I think that for a lot of diseases, the problem is often the solution, right? It's a solution for something. It's holding a place. It's a way to release pressure for something. That takes a little bit more time and a lot of trust on the part of the patient to get down to kind of the root of where it comes from. But what I might say to a patient when it comes to picking is after finding out a lot about the picking and is, you know, where do you pick? When do you pick? What do you pick with? It gets really personal. The patient really has to trust that I'm going to be respectful with this information. We will talk about a number of things. Sometimes I'll have people numb the spots where they will pick so that they're not feeling it so much. If there's one side that they pick more than another, I might have them imagine that there's a mirror that reflects the side that they don't pick. So for instance, if they're always picking the left side with the right hand, they can imagine that their right, basically hemi body is reflected in the mirror so that the left side isn't there at all. This also works really well for pain. And then also having kind of creating an experience how will it feel 
when you no longer are picking. That can work really, really nicely. I also will do things like have a hand that is really heavy and clumsy just when it comes to doing the picking. And this works great for smoking too, where it's like that hand just isn't going to move. It is stuck in place. It is so heavy. Try as you might. You can't lift up your hand when it comes to picking your skin. And isn't it wonderful that you have two hands so that if by some force you're able to get that hand up, the other hand can just bring it right back down. That's lovely. And that's so creative also. I mean, because it sounds like the number of solutions can be endless and really tailored to the patient scenario, which I really like about that. Yeah. You know, it is actually really fun to let the patient guide the treatment. I had a guy who had an autoimmune disease. And so we kind of talked about the pathophysiology of it. And then he turned it into a game, into a video game. And we talked about white blood cells and we talked about kind of immune responses and maybe an older, wiser white blood cell talking to the younger white blood cells to not react so strongly. So, you know, it's really kind of whatever the patient is up for. You know, one of the questions that comes up a lot is the difference between hypnosis, meditation, mindfulness. Can you explain the difference if there is a difference? Yeah, yeah. It comes up in the hypnosis world too. And guided imagery, I would also include in that. Yeah, good one. I personally don't feel like there is a big difference. This is all about learning to discipline your mind. And I think that the goals are a little bit different for mindfulness or meditation than it is for hypnosis. Like hypnosis, I've got some work to do. I'm there for a goal. And and that's not to say that meditation doesn't have goals as well. It's just that I would say that for hypnosis, at least for the hypnosis, I do that the goals are a little bit more concrete. But the work that you're doing with your mind is very similar. And just like with meditation, which takes a lot of practice. Hypnosis takes practice. And so when a patient sees me, when we meet, I will record whatever I'm saying so that they can practice at home. And so that can help build that muscle. It's kind of like physical therapy where it's like, you can just come and see me every three weeks and we can you know, kind of poke along. But if you would like to make some rapid progress with this, you're going to have to do some work on, at home on your own. You know, I have a question for you, Sam. You know, we talk about hypnosis and how you're using it in the clinic. Are there particular patients that are just better suited for hypnosis? Or let me ask it a different way. Are there patients where you say, you know, hypnosis is probably not going to be a good modality for this particular patient? Thank you. That's a really important thing to clarify. So I think that if there is someone who is motivated for change, that's the best one, the best kind of patient you can have. Somebody who's open to hypnosis, the patient's who dissociate readily, like if people have a a history of severe trauma and they have a hard time kind of even remembering what reality they're in most of the time, I would not recommend hypnosis for them unless they're working with someone who's really skilled. If a patient is actively psychotic, I don't think that they should be getting hypnosis. If a patient is resistant, it's just not going to work. I was talking to somebody on an airplane once about how I did hypnosis or medical hypnosis. And he said, well, I bet you can't hypnotize me. And I said, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Probably I not. <laughs> yeah. So that was the end of that. And he's like, just try. And I was like, why would I? Why would I waste my time? So, you know, if people are coming to prove something, like if they say, I did everything to try to quit smoking, I even did hypnosis. And then, you know, so it's just becoming kind of the exclamation point at the end of this long journey of trying to quit smoking. It's probably not going to work. Absolutely. No. Key principles on patient selections. I have a more uh, practical question, although we talked so much practical stuff. So do you need a special license to practice hypnosis? And also, where can people who are listening to us can find a hypnosis expert near them? Is there a resource that's reliable? Yes. So I suppose anybody can do hypnosis. The guy who introduced me to hypnosis was a therapist. And he read a book about hypnosis when he was in high school and he used it to hypnotize his brother and then then he became a therapist and then used hypnosis therapeutically. So my point is like, you can read about it and watch podcasts and do it. I chose to do conferences through the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis and they have conferences maybe six a year and 
there they have a nice laddered approach where there's an introduction and intermediate courses and then more advanced courses based on what you're interested in. And then you can apply to become a diplomat through ASCH, which involves working with a mentor and kind of reviewing cases and videotaping yourself and things like that, which is not something that I have chosen to complete, but it's something that I may consider in the future. So if someone is looking for a person who will do hypnosis for them, they would be able to go through the ASCH website and there would be the people who are diplomats within ASCH. Otherwise, it can be a little more complicated. Psychology Today, they have wonderful filters for finding therapists in, in any community. They may be able to filter to hypnosis to, if you are looking for specifically a therapist who does hypnosis, because there are a lot more therapists than there are physicians who do hypnosis. And I just want to clarify that this is the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis, right? So people can use that as a resource. Absolutely spectacular. I mean, we've learned so much about hypnosis and how to utilize it in the clinic. I think now if clinicians want to refer patients, uh, be it in dermatology and beyond, I can see endless uses to this. I think a lot of, you mentioned hormonal therapy. I think a lot of our patients suffer from hormonal imbalances that result in some skin manifestations. We all do surgeries. And so preparing our patients for surgery sounds like a great idea. And reducing the need for anesthesia just with increasing the pain tolerance. I mean, the possibilities sound endless. And now we know what it takes and we know who can do it for us. I think we've learned a lot. Thank you so much, Sam. Oh, you're so welcome. Oh, yeah, this is fantastic. I love the fact that you're a practicing clinician on top of it all. So you're really building this into, you know, patient care where we probably do have some limits and challenges with just the standard Western approach. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what makes it really fun. And I get to know patients in a really special way. I mean, it's just different because I have more time with them. And it's a nice kind of creative way to help approach illnesses that have been tricky or difficult. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time and expertise. Of course. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode with Dr. Raja and Dr. Hadar. This podcast is brought to you by Learn Skin, leaders in integrative dermatology education. Visit learnskin.com forward slash podcast to explore our many programs or subscribe to the podcast today and never miss an episode. Hey, have a great day and stay curious.